So welcome to Meeting C++ Online, uh, all around the world in all countries, uh, I guess, mostly Europe, but all countries in the world. Uh, today's talk is going to be about move-only types and how they can save the API. Uh, I guess uh, most of us know each other well from previous Meeting C++ conferences and other places. But for those that do not know me, I'm a KDAP senior software engineer. And apart from that, I wrote a book on functional programming in C++. I've been a KD developer for quite a long time now, and I do some uh, university teachings. So uh, for people that do know me, uh, you all know that I start all my talks with a disclaimer, and uh, more specifically with a quote by Phil Wadler. Uh, make your code readable, pretend that the next person who looks at your code is a psychopath, and that they know where you live. Obviously, this doesn't mean that everybody should be able to read your code. Uh, it means that your code should be beautiful, and that if people want to learn how to write proper programs, then they should be able to read your code, because your code should be a proper program. So we're going to start the talk with um, let's say, a parallel world to C++. And that's something that uh, is usually happening in the function programming world. So in, in our world in C++ it, and, let's say, in a usual object-oriented world and usual uh, world of uh, enterprise software development, uh, we tend to have some global state, and then we tend to change it to, get, to call getters, to call setters. And whenever we want to change something, we just call a setter, and that that world is, let's say, modified. So, in functional programming, uh, the data is usually uh, not mutable. So, so, in functional programming, uh, we don't uh, usually have the opportunity to uh, to change the current world. Uh, what we can do is instead create a new world with something modified. And the previous world is just going to sit there unmodified. If anybody has a reference to the old world, they will still see the old world even if we created a new copy that, that has something modified in it. And that, this is what happens. Whenever you make a decision in the world, you, in essence, create a dozen of parallel worlds. And uh, you always create a new world that is modified, a new world that is modified, etc. The problem is that we are usually just only concerned by the current world. We don't really care about all the history uh, that, that happened before uh, the world that we just created. So creating all the copies is a little bit tedious and it's a little bit expensive. And uh, the same Philip Wadler that I showed the quote at the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, he wrote a paper about how linear types can change the world. And what is a linear type? Uh, if a value belongs to a linear type, it must be used exactly once. So just like the, the world that we live in, they cannot be duplicated, they cannot be destroyed. And you, then you don't need reference counting or garbage collection, which is quite a common thing to have in functional programming languages, and not only in the functional programming languages. And one of the things that I really uh, like about uh, this paper is the title itself. Uh, it's obviously an expression that uh, linear types are really, really that important that they can change the world, but uh, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So, as we said, in pure function programming languages, you cannot change the world ever. You always create clones. But here, uh, Phil is implying that with linear types, you actually can change values inside of the pure functional programming languages. Now the question is, OK, uh, I, I'm trying not to talk about functional programming in C++ anymore. But again, I did it. Uh, why do I talk about functional programming in the C++ at a C++ meetup? In C++, we have probably the most important character uh, since C++ got invented, and that's the closing curly brace. And we all learned that the closing curly brace is something that uh, frees up all the resources that we've taken by our program, 
and we don't need to care about uh, freeing dynamic memory, we don't need to care about closing files, etc. But there is one really important resource that is never going to be freed by the closing curl embrace. And that, that's the time. If he spent time, spent time for something, we can never get it back. Uh, it doesn't matter how, my, how many closing calibrations you write. So, where does most of the time uh, in a C++ program get, uh, how do we lose most of the time? Mainly by copying. So, we kind of have learned to use references all around and have huge problems with threading and shared state and everything else. So it's quite a common occurrence in the recent C++ years to use values instead of references to something. But if you always use values, we're just going to end up with a lot of copies. And in C++ 11, we got something that when we want to create a modified copy, uh, we don't read and we don't need the original. We don't really need to create a proper copy and then destroy the old version. We can just use move semantics. And instead of creating a copy and then modifying the copy, we can just steal uh, the, the data from the previous value and put it inside of the new one and modify it, thus essentially destroying the original value. So instead of copying the world, we are just going to steal the old world and mutate the data. And this kind of looks like uh, what Phil Vatla was talking about with linear types. We are pretending to make a copy. So we have a new value. We don't have a reference to something. We have a new value, but behind the scenes, we destroyed the old one because we don't need it anymore. And when people talk about move semantics, they often talk about, uh, let's say, ownership. So unique pointer, unique ownership, you're going to transfer the ownership from one place to another. And obviously, what, I, what uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, most semantics are usually connected also with optimization because we don't need to create copies. But another important uh, part of most semantics is that uh, by using our value references, in your API, you're actually documenting the API and how it's uh, properly used. So for example, if you see a function that's called foo and it accepts a type, type ref ref, you know that you're going to pass a temporary object or let's say an object that you don't uh, need anymore with destiny move. And the API communicates that it's going to steal the contents of and destroy the original value without actually copying it. If you have a member function that is our value qualified, then you're communicating that uh, whatever this points to, that's the value that is temporary or the value that you're not, no longer going to need when you call foo. And obviously, if you return an array value reference from a function, just forget that this is a little bit dangerous, you're also kind of communicating that you're returning an existing object that can be destroyed by the caller. And if you have a function that uh, at the same time accepts an instance, uh, uh, an R value reference to a value, and returns an R value reference to a value, it communicates that it's going to steal the original value, do something with it, and return it as the result. Again, without cloning, without copying, without anything else. So where can this be, uh, this, let's say, API uh, enrichment can be used? With SDD get line, it's quite a common thing to actually not know what it does. When you see SDD get line, SDD C in comma S, it doesn't really look that intuitive because you're just uh, calling a function with two arguments where does the, re the result get stored? And uh, it's quite often to have input output uh, parameters for a function in C++ because, for example, in the uh, situation with std get line, it's much faster to reuse the existing string when reading a new line than actually returning a new string as a, a result from the get line function. 
So we are sacrificing the, the, uh, the nice API for performance, which is something that is commonly done in C++. In some other languages, they go the other way. So they try to force beautiful APIs, but then the performance suffers. Here, today we are going to try to invent something that will allow us to have both the nice APIs and uh, a proper performance that we expect from a C++ program. So just imagine if uh, GetLine had this API. So it accepts an input stream. Obviously, it needs to read from somewhere. Uh, it accepts a uh, R value reference to a string, and it's called the buffer. So we know immediately what it's going to be used for. And it returns a new string, more specifically, an R value reference to a string. So it accepts an input stream. It accepts the previously allocated string where we can store something, but a string that we don't care about the original value anymore. And it's going to return a value, a new string that has been read. And this API, if you just saw this function, you would understand what it does. And when you call it, you could just say s, assign get line to s, uh, use c in, and the previous value that is stored in s, we don't care about it, so just call std move of s. So there is just uh, one diversion that I want to make that the ref ref that we've uh, learned to love over the years in C11 doesn't really work all that well with uh, templates. So when you write a template function and uh, your parameter is trefref, most uh, newcomers to C++ would expect this to be, again, an R value reference, but now it's a completely different beast. It's a forwarding reference. So how can we write generic functions that are not going to have forwarding references, but have normal R value references? So in C20, uh, this is the group that, uh, let's say, that voted in C20 in Prague. Uh, a new feature to the language uh, was introduced, and that those are concepts. So if you want to think about concepts in uh, old terms of C, you can just think about them as uh, meta functions that const expert uh, that return a bool. So something that is uh, that can be evaluated during compile time and returns true or false. So essentially, that's a concept. So in C++20, we got a nice syntax for it, and we got a nice syntax for restricting generic functions uh, on a specific concept. So if you want to create a concept that checks whether the type t is an integer, you can just use uh, you can just write concept is int is same b t and int. Obviously, this would be a completely useless concept. And you should never write concepts like this. Concepts should model something more abstract. This is just a demonstration of what a concept syntax uh, looks like. So if you wanted to restrict a generic function, you could just say template type name t requires that t satisfies the isint concept. And now we can only call this function full on integers which is, again, obviously a little bit uh, strange to write a generic function that works only on integers, but this is just to demo the syntax itself. And even if you didn't use uh, the concept syntax to define concepts, but still use the context for bool variant, we can also put it inside of the requires clause, because as I said, concepts and context for bool meta functions are essentially the same thing. Now the question is, uh, how can we restrict our templates, uh, template functions, to only work on R value references? So we need to find something to put inside of the requires clause for the function foo. And if you consult the reference collapsing rules, uh, I'm not going to go through them uh, at this point. You can check Scott Myers' uh, the late, his latest book. Uh, he explained all of this quite well. We can just see that the only thing that we need to check is to make sure that t is not an L value reference. So whatever t is, if it's not an L value reference, uh, 
it's a good enough restriction to allow only uh, R values or proper values to be passed to the function template hoop. So uh, to end the digression, let's get back to performance and uh, the problems with copying. So if we have a sequence of strings, uh, a vector input stream sequence or anything else, and we want to concatenate all of them, we could write code that looks like this. So std string result, then loop through, through the sequence, and then just append each of the tokens, each of the elements of the sequence uh, onto the result variable. But we should remember what Sean Perrin said. He said that we should never, ever, ever, ever use raw for loops. So instead of this, we should use some of the STL algorithms. And the algorithm that essentially does the same thing is the STD accumulate. Now, this is a little bit prettier version of STD accumulate that doesn't accept a pair of iterators, but accepts just an input sequence and initial value. But the problem with this approach is that STD accumulate, especially before C20, was quite unoptimized or uh, to say pessimized. So in each of the iterations, we would have uh, to concatenate the previously accumulated value in it with the current uh, value from the collection. Then we would end up with a new string and we would assign that string to init. And this creates a lot of copies. So for each of the plus operators, it's going to create a temporary string, then assign it to, to be the new accumulated value. And again, for the next operator plus, for the next operator plus, for the next operator plus, it's always going to allocate, 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 and assign, allocate and assign, which is quite, quite unoptimized. Uh, when we do the accumulation, after we do the concatenation uh, of the previously accumulated value with the current element, we don't need the previously accumulated value. So instead, we can just say init becomes as the move of init. So we no longer need the old value plus star first. In this case, uh, instead of doing the normal concatenation, which produces a new string, the operator plus uh, in as the string is our value reference qualified. And that specific operator plus is just going to call init.append. So in this case, we, are, we, uh, we don't really create a new string every time. We are just going to append on the previous one. Now, the only problem that remains here, which we will see that it actually has an impact on the performance, is that it still calls the operator, the assignment operator to assign it to init. Even if this is a temporary, and if, even if that assignment operator will be move assignment operator, so let's say efficient, it still is not free. So it still needs to do something. So the conclusion of the previous part should be that copying is the killer of the performance in our, uh, in our programs. So the question is if we can enforce linearity in C++. When can linearity be useful? So if you're writing generic functions like the algorithms in STL, it could be quite useful to test them on move-only uh, types because that way you're going to make sure that you're not accidentally making copies anywhere in your generic code. In the cases for when you have message passing systems or reactive streams or ranges, where you're just putting values through a series of transformations, it's also useful to test those with move-only types to make sure that none of the transformations actually is copying any data. Because if you're just going to move a value through a series of transformations, it should be moved, not copied. And it's also useful for optimizing your let's say, compile time tricks when you want to implement your own DSLs and then uh, transform the abstract syntax trees of your DSL during compile time. Again, you should uh, want to avoid copies at all cost. 
So, if you wanted to test whether SDD accumulate is a properly implemented uh, algorithm, we could test it with a unique pointer or anything that is move only. Let's skip a few slides. And if SDD accumulate or any other generic function is not properly implemented and it actually tries to make a copy, you're just going to get an error. So in order to have a linear concept in C++, uh, we need to uh, define types that uh, can be moved. So all the move operations need to be supported. All the copying operations should be disallowed and moves should be as efficient as possible. Move semantics, as far as the optimization goes, is just useful if moves are efficient. If the move is as expensive as a copy, then there is actually no point in having a move, uh, move enabled type. But the problem is that we can't really kind of test at compile time whether move is efficient or not. So the only way uh, that I've found so far to approach this is to use some kind of a heuristic. If uh, the move operation is declared as uh, no throw, so it doesn't throw an exception, it implies that it doesn't allocate new memory, that it doesn't do anything overly complex. So it's kind of somewhat of a good heuristic to test whether, move, uh, whether the move operation is uh, performant or not. So we are going to try to model a concept in C++20 that uh, fulfills all the previous requirements. So if you want to have a type uh, to test that a type is movable, then we need to test two things. If we have a value of type T, can we see it as a value of type T, which is a no-brainer, we can. If we have a, a value reference to a type T, can we see it as a T? So essentially, whether we can construct it, whether we can convert it or anything else uh, to a proper value of type T. So we can define uh, two meta functions that are going, well, uh, first function will be linear usable as, and we want to say that T can be used as T and that T ref ref can be used also as T. Now, how to define the usable as. So linear usable as needs to be constructible. So if we want to say that t is uh, usable as u, u needs to be constructible from t. Uh, it needs to be not so constructible because we said that all move operations should be performant and we are going to use not throw as the heuristic for that. We need to be able to assign uh, to, uh, to T, we need to uh, be able to convert from U to T. Uh, with copies, we need to disallow several, several things. So we cannot construct, we cannot see uh, T ref and all value reference as a value of type T. We cannot see const T ref nor const T as a value of type T because all of these require some sort of copy. Now, in this case, we can't really, uh, we can't use the no throw thing anymore. So we can't use just the negation of the linear usable as. We need to write a new meta function that will be called linear unusable as. Because between uh, satisfying all three conditions and satisfying none of the conditions, we have a gray place in between uh, black and white. So we need to define the meta function that is called linear unusable as. And just like in the previous case, uh, we want to explicitly state that t ref, const t ref, and const t cannot be used as a normal value of type t. For linear unusable as, we don't care whether something is uh, no throw or it can throw. We want to abolish all copying, regardless of whether it's a performant copy or just a slow copy read that can throw an exception. So we, can, uh, we need to check that it's not constructible, not assignable, and not convertible from one type to the other. And then we can finally define the concept called linear. And we can say 
linear type needs to be not row destructible, which is, let's say, a same prerequisite for all types in the world. Uh, we need to say that it's uh, linear usable as, so T and T ref ref are usable as T. And again, concatenation of uh, T ref, const T ref, and const T are unusable as T. And we can test this uh, concept that we just created. So if you have a unique pointer, it should satisfy the linear constraint. And if you have a normal std string, it shouldn't because obviously strings have copy constructors and everything else. So if you just write linear auto pointer equals make, make unique, that will pass the compilation. If you try to do it, uh, the same thing for the std string, it's going to throw an error. Now, for people that uh, are unfamiliar with concepts, auto point, auto putter equals something. It's automatically deducing the type of putter. The same thing goes with when you pre prefix something with a name of a concept. So if you write linear auto PTR, it's going, again, to automatically deduce the type of PTR, but it's also going to check whether that deduced type satisfies the concept that you write, wrote in, in front of the auto. So in this case, it's still uh, just automatic type deduction, but with the restriction that the compiler will complain if the type that was deduced doesn't satisfy the linear constraint or the linear concept. If you want to use uh, concepts or constraints with your generic functions, again, as we've seen before, we can use the requires and we can just say template type in t requires that t is linear. And if you want to write accumulate that works only on move only types, you can write it uh, like this. So requires linear of t and auto accumulate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can even use the a little bit nicer and shorter syntax. Instead of saying type name t and then requires, you can just say template linear t. Again, T will be automatically deduced and checked whether it satisfies the concept or not. If the concept is not satisfied, this version of accumulate is going to be removed from the overload set. So it's not a hard error. In this case, it's just going to remove this accumulate from the overload set. And if some other accumulate satisfies, uh, is not, let's say, removed from the overload set, set, it's just going to continue working. So these uh, concepts can be really useful to replace all the enable ifs that you've ever wrote in your code. And if you want even shorter syntax, you can just forget about writing template anywhere and just say the argument of the function is going to be a linear auto in it. Again, the same rules apply, just shorter syntax than the previous uh, few examples. Now the question is, what to do with nonlinear types? Obviously, you have STL and you have a lot of different libraries that define types that all implement copy constructors. And if you want to implement things that you want to guarantee that nothing is ever going to be copied, you need to somehow delete all those copy operations. So we can just write a simple wrapper that contain that uh, contains a value of type T inside and deletes all the copy operations. So the move constructor and the move assignment operator are going to be defined. Obviously, no except, which is by default if you write equals default. And uh, you're going to delete all the copy operations. Uh, with regards to the constructor, when you construct, uh, the constructor should just accept a T ref ref and it should move the value into its uh, member variable. Now, just a small note, even if we are accustomed to calling T ref ref a forwarding reference, in this case, since the constructor itself is not a template function, uh, this is not a forwarding constructor. No, this is just a normal uh, R value reference. So here we are using std move and we are not using anything like it, the forward or anything similar. Uh, we can also create, uh, let's say, a more advanced constructor, which will construct the member variable in place. Uh, obviously, there are quite a few ways to do it. Uh, for me, the, 
I like the explicit way. So the first argument should be std in place tag. And then you're going to pass the arguments that will be used to construct the end value. So when you construct the end value, you're just going to forward all the arguments inside it. So it's going to in place construct the member variable inside of this wrapper. Now, if you want to create proper linear types, we've said that all the values can be used only once. So if you want to write a get member function that extracts the value that is stored inside of the wrapper, uh, first you need to refer qualify it. So it can be only called on a temporary instance of linear wrapper. It should be no except because moves on our lovely types are no except. And it should return a trfref because again, the caller can steal the value from our member value. The important thing here is to mark this uh, get function as no discard. In essence, I would advise any time that you have a function that returns a useful value, mark it as no, no discard just to make sure that whoever calls your function doesn't accidentally forget that this change is something that this, this destroys the original value that this is actually a, a useful value. Because what's the point of calling dot get if, if you don't use the value that it returns? The same goes for the star operator. It's just the same implementation as get, in just a different name. So what we can do, we can just now use uh, our linear wrapper and wrap any kind of uh, std class or any other type inside of it. And we can just even uh, create a user-defined literal suffix, underscore ls, for constructing the linearly wrapped strings. So if we called the accumulate that we wrote uh, previously, we can just say concatenated underscore ls. And in the accumulate that was before C++20, which actually performed copies, it would be a hard error. So we would see that the accumulate is not properly implemented. Now the question is, what about performance? And uh, it's quite popular in the recent years to use Godbolt for all the things in C++ world. So every uh, presentation in, on every C++ conference needs to have some, at least the Godbolt screenshot. So that's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> the first thing that I just want to show is that if you have a string and we put it inside of a linear wrapper, the assembly is completely the same. So the linear wrapper that we've defined, even if it kind of looks a little bit complex, especially with that in-place constructor. It doesn't add any kind of overhead with optimizations. This is tested with O3. Uh, I'm assuming that the same optimizations would be with O2. So this is just about the performance of the linear wrapper itself. Now the question is, we've Again, since C++11, everybody started using values instead of references because values are safer. And there were quite a few blog posts that claimed that the code is even faster uh, when you use values because of the move semantics and after that because of the return value optimizations and stuff. And I do agree. So it's for the most part, you should use values and for most part, you should rely on optimizations like RVO and named RVO. But some people don't really agree with it. Uh, and at ACCU or ACU in 2019, there was a, an interesting talk by John Lakos about allocators. And one of the claims which it was not really the point of his talk, but he mentioned it a few times, is that uh, Functional style APIs, pretty APIs that return values, etc. So immutable uh, data structures and everything else doesn't have a place in C++ because they're inherently slow. Even with uh, named value return optimization and all the other optimizations, the value from in the caller needs to be constructed. 
and all the results, even if they are moved, even if they are some, uh, sometimes optimized, all the values need to have the constructor called. So, as to the get line uh, that we've seen in, uh, at the beginning of the talk, and std and dot append should be preferred than to use just plus 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 because it's not going to construct any new strings. It's going to be much, much more performant. And I'm not saying that John is wrong, obviously. Most of the time uh, he's right, but we still can do something about even those uh, constructions. Now I'm going to skip the assembly code because whenever I say, okay, uh, this implementation compares to a shorter assembly, there is always somebody who says that, well, the shortness of assembly doesn't really mean always performance. In this case, uh, it kind of means because the short assembly is going to be a subset of the original one and really shorter. Uh, but uh, for this uh, specific talk, I actually did a few benchmarks as well. So we are going to test uh, the original example of accumulate. And the accumulate is going to go through a large a vector of strings, and it's going to concatenate all the strings. So with uh, the STD accumulate before C++20, so C++17 and earlier, and with the STD plus as the folding or accumulation function. So this is the accumulate that copies. Uh, it doesn't use the STD move on the previous value in it. This is the speed that you get. And in C20, we got the optimized STD accumulate, which now, as we've seen, uses STD move affinity and calls plus, which in, in the back end actually calls dot append. And if we wanted to benchmark that version, so C20 accumulate again with STD plus as the accumulation function, we are going to get this. So this is a huge optimization, right? Uh, the bar is essentially the same as the previous one. So we, are, we didn't really lose all that time because the old accumulate didn't have STD move. What happens if uh, we write a lambda that calls STD move of init so instead of calling, uh, instead of using std plus, which accepts things as values and produces a new string, we just wrote a lambda that accepts everything as a value and returns as a value, and just say, okay, we are not returning init plus val, we are returning from the lambda init uh, std move of init plus val. This is going to be optimized, and as you can see, this is quite a significant optimization, and this is still without any uh, R value reference inside. What happens if we uh, declare the argument for the lambda, auto ref ref, so that we have a forwarding reference, obviously we're going to use it as an R value reference. In this case, we're going to std move it from, uh, from it. It's kind of, it will be a little bit faster than the previous version, but not much faster. The reason is that whether something, uh, a function argument is a value or an R value reference. Again, move, uh, the move constructor on a string is most of the time uh, quite fast. What happens if we have a lambda that both accepts the init as an R value reference and the return value is an R value reference? This is the speed that you get. So if you write a function that not only accepts things as arguments, temporaries, as R value references, but also returns a reference to something. This is the optimization that you get. So in this case, in the whole chain of all the accumulated iterations, there isn't a single constructor called. It's uh, completely equi equivalent to the speed of just writing a huge while with a dot append, dot append, dot append. So this slide is a little bit zoomed in uh, for you to see uh, the optimized versions with C++20 and move semantics. 
against if we actually used our, our value references uh, extensively. And all the assembly is going to, be, uh, to confirm all of this. So when we return values, as we've said, we have RBO as the best optimization possible. The next one is that uh, when you say return something, it can be converted by the compiler to return std move of something if RBO is not performed. And in the worst case scenario, the result is going to be copied into the caller. Okay, we can skip this as well. Uh, so this is the case if uh, RBO doesn't work here, even if we are explicitly stating return value, the result is going to be uh, move constructed. And in this case, RBO cannot be uh, performed because the return type of the function is U and the value is of type T. So it need, the U, uh, the instance of U needs to be constructed and the constructor needs to be called. It's just nice that the compiler now allows us uh, not to write return std move of value. It automatically does that for us. So in most of the cases, when you write functions, you will write return value. And again, RBO will be performed if uh, RBO for some reason, like in this case, cannot be performed, then the move constructor will be uh, called. If the move constructor doesn't exist, then uh, the result will be copy constructed. And again, assembly that is kind of meaningless now that we've seen the benchmarks. Now the question is, uh, we often had problems when we return references of any kind from a function. So references can, be, uh, can become easily dangling references, which is obviously undefined behavior if you use them, etc. Uh, there is a really nice uh, rule in uh, the C++ standard. So all temporary objects are destroyed as the last step in evaluating the full expression, which essentially means all the temporary objects inside of an expression will exist until you write the semicolon at the end. So all the temporaries, all the references will be valid. They are not going to be a uh, dangling references. And when the semicolon uh, appears, you should convert that to a proper value and not store a dangling reference anywhere. Okay, again, skipping the assembly because we've seen the benchmarks. So uh, as a somewhat of a summary, if you have functions uh, where you have passing through values, so a function that essentially transforms original value into a new one, like std get line, consider returning an R value reference because it will allow you not to have any constructors in your code, any unnecessary constructors in your code. Obviously, if you don't have the passing through values, be cautious of dangling references. You can rely on the fact that temporaries are destroyed at the semicolon, but make sure that you don't do anything insane uh, with, with this fact. And in order to be as safe as possible, never store anything inside of an uh, R value or R value reference, store all results by value. So you will have a chain of functions that you have called all the functions will work on temporaries on R value references. And the final result is the only result that will actually be stored in a proper value. So just for that one, you'll need to call the constructor. Uh, obviously, again, dangling references a huge problem. Uh, in one of the Nikos, uh, Yosutis, uh, yeah, I shouldn't call him Niko probably. Uh, so one of his examples was that uh, returning R value references is a little bit problematic because if you chain calls like this, you're going to end up with a dangling reference. When you start iterating over this, the old value is going to be destroyed and this is undefined behavior. Fortunately, we now have the new and improved version of the range-based for loop. You can store the result of foo 
which returns an R value reference inside of a proper value, so not a reference value. And then you can just iterate it like any other collection. Again, an example of where you have functions that return uh, references or other R value references in this case, you should always store the results, the final results inside of a proper value. Um, some additional advice, use clang tidy, use as many warnings uh, as possible, convert them to errors. So one of the uh, biggest uh, warning that is related to this talk is the unused variable. So if somebody is calling a function that returns a, a variable, you don't want to allow anybody to ignore that value. So turn this uh, uh, warning into an error. For error handling, a lot of things uh, from, let's say, cleaner API uh, world are destroyed by exceptions. And if you want to use some error handling that uh, that are not exceptions, so still to have a nice API, you can use optional of T, you can use expected of T, comma e. optional is obviously in the standard, expected is not yet, but there are a couple nice libraries, one from Cybrand, uh, there is a boost outcome, which ex implements expected in a little bit different way, etc. So just play around and test whatever suits you. And I think that this is my time, a little bit more than 45 minutes. Uh, you can always reach me at uh, either through my personal or my professional address. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter, even underscore uh, CUKC. And I guess you all know uh, the book. So that's it. <laughs>